Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending Center for Vein Restoration's National CME Series. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Nick Morrison. Dr. Nick Morrison is the immediate past president of the International Union of Phlebology and past president of the American College of Phlebology and a diplomat of the American Board of Venous and Lymphatic Medicine. He is a general surgeon by training, but since 1996, he has concentrated his practice on the care and treatment of venous and lymphatic disorders. After over 20 years in his own private venous practice, he joined Center for Vein Restoration in 2018 and is pleased to be part of the CVR team. Dr. Morrison will provide more information on today's presentation and our national CME series, Venus Exchange. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Lackenpaul was due to be the MC for this, and uh, he had he was called away emergently. So I have the privilege of taking over for him. Uh, and can I have the next slide? I'm hoping the slides are changing. If there it is. Also, a couple of reminders for this session. Uh, really does help to mute yourself or we get some background noise it really is disruptive to the uh, presenter so uh, please mute uh please submit your questions through that zoom chat feature and we'll try to get all the questions um if you can't get to them your uh, local physician will reach out to you um you'll receive your cme certificate through your cvr physician something i can't quite see it. there it is physician liaison or digitally via email um, the access to these CME presentations is the, listed there, and you can go back and, and watch them uh, over and over again if you miss something. And then uh, further questions or suggestions on topics to be presented, please contact me. Uh, more, a better option is to contact Dr. Lackenpaul or Dr. Nguyen, uh, since I don't have that opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit, just a, a little bit about uh, Center for Vein Restoration. This is a large national multi-office uh, entity. Most of the centers are on the Eastern Seaboard. And the reason I say that is because I'm out in Arizona. So uh, I'm one of two in Arizona, but most of them are uh, along that Eastern Seaboard and then in the upper Midwest, but they are also scattered around. There's some in Texas, in uh, Alabama, uh, South Carolina, I believe in uh, Mississippi. So they're, they're, and it's growing rapidly. They now have uh, 90 clinics in 20 states. Oh, I forgot uh, Don Ives up in uh, Alaska. So he's there as well and uh, New Mexico. So uh, about 90 clinics or a little over 90. They're adding some uh, very often. They have about 500 full-time employees with 62 active physicians in all of these. So most of the Centers have uh, one doc who travels to a couple of centers sometimes. Uh, the volume, because of all of these all of these centers, the volume is incredible. We have uh, seen 40,000 new patients in 2019 alone. And I lost that, uh, I guess we're moving on. <laughs> That's a picture of uh, the physicians. There's some really good people in this organization. and. Uh, I would, in, I would invite you to get to know some of them because there's some real top-notch people here. And the next slide. So I want to introduce our, our uh, presenter and the topic, uh, which is tips and tricks to tame telangiectasias. This is uh, Mehul Shah. He is a board certified vascular physician performing vein treatments for the past 30 years. He was the founder and medical director of his independent practice, Vascular Medicine Center, for 28 years. He is currently the lead physician for Center for Vein Restoration in the uh, same location in King of Prussia, right outside Philadelphia. He is a fellowship trained vascular medicine specialist, training at the Cleveland Clinic and Foundation. He's also a fellow for the Society of Vascular Medicine and has performed thousands of vein procedures utilizing modern vein treatment. So with all due respect, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shaw.
Thank you, Dr. Morrison, for that kind introduction. Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome. The topic for the CME webinar tonight is tips and tricks to tame telangiectasias. I have no conflict of interest to declare. This CME webinar is coming to you live from Philadelphia. As the slogan says, the city of brotherly love. Home to the Liberty Bell, the oldest medical school in the US, University of Pennsylvania Medical School, and above all the Philly fanatic. Just to check on you, the audience, if you are alert and awake, we are first going to play a game, two truths and a lie. You will figure out which of the two statements are true and one statement is a lie. I will need them, I'll read them slowly. So here are the three statements. One, Controversial, a controversial medicine used to treat COVID-19 was also an uh, old medicine used for sclerotherapy. Two, in the 1800s, hyperpigmentation from sclerotherapy was treated by applying bleach directly to the skin. Number three, the first sclerotherapy was performed in 1682 by injecting acid into the veins. Drum roll, please. And here are the answers. Number one is a truth. An article in The Lancet in May 1924 mentions intravenous use of quinine for treatment of varicose veins. Number two is a lie. Number three is a truth. First reported attempt at sclerotherapy was by D. Zollikoffer in Switzerland in 1682, who injected acid to induce thrombus formation. And I bet it was very painful. This is the fan-shaped cluster of spider veins called the ankle flare or medically corona phlebectatica, an early sign of advanced vein disease. It is hard to imagine that simple sclerotherapy will lead good results. In fact, in an hour, you will even know how to treat corona phlebectatica. Today's agenda, number one, Types of veins and anatomy of cutaneous venous microcirculation. Number two, identification of venous insufficiency. Number three, types of treatment and how to improve results of venous telangiectasias. Number four, avoid and treat complications. Number five, patient examples and treatment. Number six, the last 15 minutes will be devoted to question and answers session. And you may Submit your question and answer questions through the chat box on Zoom. Let's start with the first item on the agenda, the types of veins and anatomy of cutaneous venous microcirculation. Today's topic, as you know, is venous telangiectasias, which is the class one of the SEEP score, and the rest are the, the class two to six are the advanced disease. Patients get confused sometimes when they come to my office. They are unsure whether they have varicose veins or spider veins. And I have to, I talk to them as if uh, showing them the pictures that these are the ropey varicose veins versus the medium sized vessels, which are the reticular veins, and the small uh, venous telangiectasia or spider veins, which Sometimes they confuse, they, when they come call the office initially, 
they will say, I have varicose veins, but when they come in, they might have spider veins and vice versa. Quite often, varicose veins and spider veins are related, just like father and son in this picture. Quite often, varicose veins and spider veins, they coexist, and often peacefully when they are asymptomatic, and not so peacefully when they are symptomatic. When varicose veins are treated, often spider veins may not disappear, and patients need to be told this ahead of time. Otherwise, they may go back to the primary care physician or the referring physician and say, hey, the doctor refer treated my varicose veins, but my spider veins are still there. Spider veins may represent the tip of the iceberg. When spider veins are symptomatic, it could represent the tip of the iceberg. What you see may not be what you have got. There may be more to it than what meets the eye. By definition, spider veins are intradermal small vessels up to one millimeter, and reticular veins are often tortuous subdermal vessels, one to three millimeter in size, and the varicose veins are more than three millimeter in size. This is an important slide to understand the cutaneous microcirculation. The venous telangiectasias may represent a manifestation of cutaneous hypertension. The important part of this slide of cutaneous microcirculation is the presence of microvalves in the smaller vessel between the dermis and the subcutaneous tissue. When axial vein reflux is absent, in patient is symptomatic venous telangiectasias, uh, symptomatic in the sense that they may have itching, burning, or throbbing. Think of small vessel inflow problem with reflux. When patient with venous telangiectasias present to me, I first try to figure if their symptoms are of venous origin or not, and if it is medical or cosmetic problem. Often varicose veins, reticular veins, and venous telangiectasias are coexisting together. If venous insufficiency is present, I start treatment for the venous insufficiency, followed by the varicose veins, the reticular veins, and then the venous telangiectasia treatment. I may need to treat you using different modalities for different types of veins. So it is important that a specialist trained to treat different veins with different methods is involved with the treatment of this problem. The second item on the agenda is identification of the venous insufficiency. Tip number one is to appropriately use ultrasound to identify the venous reflux in a standing position. This is the picture showing the reflux being present in a venous insufficiency exam. Item number three on the agenda is types of treatment and how to improve results of the venous telangiectasias. Once venous insufficiency has been diagnosed, one has the option to treat by thermal or non-thermal modality. The thermal modalities may be the RF catheter, which is shown on the left, and the laser fiber on the right. The non-thermal, non-tumescent, non-sclerosant modality, which is venous seal, using cyanoacrylate adhesive, can be utilized as well. If there are symptomatic varicose veins following the ablation, then these bulging varicose veins may need to be treated using microflobectomy, using local anesthetic with pinpoint opening one to two millimeter in size. 
Tip number two is to treat big to small. It is important to treat the varicose veins with the reflux. So here you can see the blue reticular vein feeding the spider veins. So always put the horse before the cart. Treat the feeder vein first before spider veins or treat the varicose veins with the reflux first before treating the spider veins. Tip number three is use transelimination to identify the feeder vessel. Treatment of telangiectasias or spider veins, the standard sclerotherapy is still the gold standard, is, it? is the most effective. Surface laser using NDAG 1064 laser may be effective in select cases, but is the second line of defense in my mind. On the face, on the other hand, the surface laser modalities work very well and works like a charm. However, on the legs, the circulation is different, the anatomy is different, and therefore the visual sclerotherapy is more effective in my mind than the surface laser and is less painful as well. Sclerotherapy involves introduction of the sclerosin into the lumen of the vein, which induces inflammation and subsequent fibrosis. It leads to clearance of the spider vein or the reticular veins, improving the cosmetic appearance on the leg. Sclerotherapy is both a science and an art. Injecting the veins is easy. However, injecting them well is quite, is not easy, it's difficult. This is an example of beautiful results when sclerotherapy is done correctly with visual sclerotherapy with the before and after pictures as shown here. There are two FDA approved options which are sodium tetradecyl sulfate or STS. And the other one is polydocanol. The other agents utilized quite often are hypertonic saline and glycerin, but they are not FDA approved for sclerotherapy. Here is a dilution chart, which is tip number four for STS or sodium tetradecyl sulfate, which can be utilized for polydocanol as well. Please feel free to email me if you would like to receive this chart by email. This is the traditional sclerotherapy technique, which causes damage to the endothelium, which leads to fibrosis of the, of the vein wall. To take the game to the next level, this is tip number five. I innovated cryosclerotherapy about 15 years ago, which was a game changer for me. I started using cold air device, which is this. It's a Zimmer cold air device while doing the sclerotherapy. And I have a video which will demonstrate how I do it. So with my left hand, I'm holding the cold air blowing onto the skin, which numbs the skin. And on, with my right hand, I'm injecting the sclerosin solution, my venous cocktail into the vein. And you can see that effectively it numbs it, it makes it virtually painless for the patient and the results are much better. So the advantages, discuss the advantages of, to, of cryosclerotherapy. Number one, the cold air numbs the skin and makes the procedure virtually painless. In the traditional sclerotherapy, if the pain level on a scale of zero to 10 is five or six, with the cryosclerotherapy I have found that the pain level drops to one to two. It makes the pain, it makes the vein go into spasm after the injection. So less sclerosin leaks out. It is more effective and hence less number of sessions are needed 
and patients are more satisfied and therefore the results are much better. This is a picture of asymptomatic spider veins before and after and within a couple of sessions you can get beautiful results. This is another picture showing the before and after slide. Now, this is another picture showing cryosclerotherapy with nice results. The goals of cryosclerotherapy is to get consistent response to the treatment and minimize the hemosiderin staining or no hemosiderin staining in the ideal setting and make it virtually painless. Tip number six is to determine which sclerosant solution is most suitable to a given patient. In some, some individuals will, will be better candidates for use of polydoconol and others may be may better, they may, they may tolerate STS better. So what I do is I use polydoconol in the lowest concentration on one leg and STS on the other leg to begin and then proceed from there. The next tip, number seven, is to increase the sclerosin solution strength gradually. I use 0.1 to 0.3% strength to begin and then gradually increase my strength. Tip number eight is to the strategy for resistant telangiectasias. When the telangiectasias are found to be resistant, don't hesitate to mix polydoconol, STS, and hypertonic saline to make one plus one plus one equal to five. So in other words, you're using a low concentration of each of those ingredients and the overall venous cocktail is more effective with reduction of the chance of hemosiderin stain. This is very important. My conclusion about the ideal strength for sclerosin is for Sotra de or STS is 0.075% to 0.1% diluted. And for polydoconol is 0.33%. Patients ask, often ask me, why me? Why am I the subject of these venous telangiectasias? Well, I tell them it is, you are not alone. On that note, let's play a trivia game. Uh, we have to, you have to name the celebrity with the veins. So whose legs are these? Which celebrities' veins are shown on these legs. I will give a hint. The movie line was, you had me at hello. Drum roll, please. Well, it was Rene Zellweger. Let's talk about the, let's talk on the next uh, agenda item, which is avoid and treat complications. So one of the common complications um, is, as you know, hemosiderin staining with sclerotherapy. The incidence of this is 0.3 to 30%. 70 to 90% of the times, the hemosiderin stains will disappear within one year. However, unfortunately, in one to 10%, it may be permanent. What one needs to know is the hemosiderin stains, the type of sclerosin agent, as we discussed, you have to figure out which one is the culprit, whether patient is tolerating polydoconol or sort of, uh, STS better. So once you have figured that out, one has to know higher the concentration, higher the pressure while injecting 
may predispose the patient to hemosiderin stain. The foam, the dark skin, trapped blood in certain areas on the legs may lead to higher incidence of hemosiderin stain. So one has to be cognizant of that fact. So tip number nine is preventing hemosiderin stains is better than cure. The money is in the venous cocktail. So I believe in customizing my venous cocktail. One has to figure out which sclerosin is best for a given patient. Once you do that, then go from lower to higher strength of the sclerosin. I would treat no sooner than six weeks again for the next session. Another important tip is to add 72% glycerin and heparin in small amounts to the venous cocktail along with the sclerosin agent to reduce the incidence of hemosiderin staining. Tip number 10 is once hemosiderin stains have happened, how do you treat them? Well, you have two options. One is to wait about six months. While you're waiting, you can use topical agents such as triluma ointment or just prescribe three different prescriptions containing hydroquinone, tretinoin, and steroid, which is less expensive than trans triluma. And then after six months, if the hemosiderin stains have not disappeared, then you consider using laser. And the lasers that are common used, commonly used are listed here. The KTP laser with 532 wavelength, Alexandrite laser with 755, nanometer wavelength, QSIG, the ag laser, picosecond laser, and you, one can also use intense pulse light. These are some of the lasers I use in my office. Let's play the next trivia game. Again, if you missed out on the first trivia quiz, whose legs are these? Which celebrity's legs are these? I'll give you a hint. This, so this was the original supermodel. It's time for redemption for some of you. Drum roll, please. Well, it's supermodel Janice Dickinson. I hope you got it. Let's talk about the second complication. Neovascularization, also called angiogenesis or angioneogenesis, or also commonly referred to as matting. So this is how the before and after picture may look to you. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is matting or what is neovascularization? It refers to the appearance of tiny new red telangiectasias that appear in patients after sclerotherapy or surgical removal of varicose veins. Actually, it can happen after ablation, can happen after microphlebectomy, or even after sclerotherapy for the larger vessels. There are two types of angiogenesis, which I will come to in a second. So the incidence may be 15 to 20%. Um, however, the good news is it disappears within three to 12 months when it's transient. When it's permanent, the most common locations are on the inner and outer thighs, and near the knees and the calves. The procedure-related risk factors are, again, high concentration of the sclerosin, high volume of the sclerosing agent, high injection pressure, and it can also happen when there is venous hypertension and there is failure to close all sources of reflux. Patient-related risk factors can be hormone treatment, and over-treatment. My tip number 11 is how to treat neovascularization. Again, mild angiogenesis may subside on its own without treatment. One can reevaluate in six weeks. Angiogenesis, secondary to persistent inflow of treated area, so one needs to treat the persistent inflow. So that's one of the etiologies. The second etiology is inflammatory angiogenesis. When that is the case, one can treat with IPL or laser. 
besides cryosclerotherapy. So this can be the neovascularization before and after treatment. And the one good recommendation is to identify the feeder vessel at the superficial level in the, in the skin, under the skin, which may be quite tiny at times. And you can see in the dermal and epidermal level, some of the vessels which are feeders. Sometimes there are bigger tribs, which bigger tributaries, which can be treated with ultrasound guided foam. You are cannulating the tributary here with the needle and you are using the tessari method to create the foam or use verathena. And here is the injection uh, on the right showing the ultrasound guided foam, and this is in the transverse view. So let's play the third and final trivia of the name the celebrity with the veins. And here are the legs of a celebrity. I will give a hint. She is a famous pop singer. And did you guess it? Drum roll, please. Oops, she did it again. It's Britney Spears. I hope you got it. Let's move on to the third and final complication. So we are dealing today with three common complications, or three major complications. One was hemosiderin stain, Number two was matting. And number three now is skin necrosis. Skin necrosis is due to extravasation of the solution into the perivascular, <coughs> excuse me, uh, due to perivascular arterial occlusion. And the incidence is up to 1.3%. The causes of skin necrosis is high sclerosin strength, high injection pressure, high volume of the sclerosin, direct intraarterial injection, passing of the sclerosin through arteriovenous anastomosis, and venoarterial reactive venospasm. Tip number 12, how to prevent skin necrosis. Use low injection pressure, low sclerosin concentration. And it's better to use multiple injections than to, with less amount of sclerosin than to use a high volume of injection in a given, at a given, with a given uh, point. How to treat if skin necrosis does happen with the extravasation? It is important to use normal saline to dilute the hypertonic solution uh, 10 times the volume if that's what was utilized and with sodium tetradecyl sulfate, to, one can use hyaluron, hyaluronidase. Now, back to the question of how to treat corona phlebectatica. Up to this point, I'm sure you guys have figured out how to do that effectively. And here is the answer. One should treat venous reflux if present with endovenous thermal or non-thermal ablation. As I said before, it is, a, it is an early sign of, of, the, <clears throat> of the extensive uh, venous disease. And one should also treat tributary reflux with ultrasound guided foam or verathena as the second uh, modality. Now, now that we have covered quite a bit of material about spider veins, spider vein treatment, let's use this Zen as a palate cleanser and take a deep breath before we go over a few clinical cases. This picture is from the Longwood Gardens in Philadelphia, and you may not be able to smell the roses because these are tulips. Fifth item on the agenda is patient examples and treatment. Case one, 
This is a female, 32 years old. The aesthetic complaint of reticular veins, hormonal IUD, no previous sclerotherapy attempts. How would you treat this? It's pretty straightforward. You rule out axial vein reflux, treat with liquid or foam sclerotherapy. Case number two is a female, 67 years old, aesthetic complaint of bruise after a varicose vein treatment two years ago on hormonal replacement therapy, six previous sclerotherapy attempts. This is matting. If you want to treat this effectively, one has to get rid of axial vein reflux if present, treat the tributary with foam, treat spider veins with cryosclerotherapy, and you will get nice results. Tip number 13, how do you treat aneurysmal dilatation of spider veins? These are the bubbly spider veins on the skin surface. If one tries to use sclerotherapy just by itself, or even cryosclerotherapy for that matter, the patient is at very high risk of hemosiderin staining. One has to rule out and treat axial vein reflux if present. One has to rule out and treat refluxing tributaries if they are present. The ideal solution in my mind is microflobectomy with the smallest hook available following tumescence and dilute, cryos, dilute sclerosin and cryosclerotherapy. This will give you the best results. A word on how to treat facial veins. As I mentioned, on the face, spider veins as well as reticular veins, they respond beautifully like a charm with lasers very predictably. This is the <clears throat> pocket flow chart and is a summary of what we have discussed today. If anyone wishes to receive the slide, please email CVR and we will be happy to get you that. It, it uh, talks about how to address spider veins when they are symptomatic versus asymptomatic, and if there are complications, how to deal with it. With that, I thank you for your attention. And before we go to <clears throat> questions within a minute, I would like to announce that uh, <clears throat> if you like the CME webinar, I would like to announce our next CME webinar <clears throat> by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Laura Kelsey, on Tuesday, October 27, at 6.30 p.m. Please register at the website, which is listed on this slide. She's pretty, pretty great, she does a good job. We are now going to be ready to <clears throat> take questions. Okay, uh, Dr. Shaw, thanks very much. What a, uh, what a good talk, really good talk. Uh, very innovative and uh, we appreciate all of the information. You covered a lot of ground. Um, one of the first uh, comments or questions that we have is uh, for aneurysmal spider veins, assuming no truncal reflux, why not use foam sclerotherapy? So, uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, as I said, if you use foam sclerotherapy, you're gonna have a high incidence of hemosiderin stain staining and you need to stretch those tortuous walls and that's why the tumescence and it is one can one can do the dilute foam sclerotherapy after you tumesce and do the microflobectomy at the same time and that will give you in my mind the ideal results of getting beautiful results with no hemosiderin staining great thank you there's a uh... A comment, awesome presentation, <laughs> it, just, it was. Um, what size needle and syringe do you use? <clears throat> I use a 32 gauge needle and a 3cc syringe in most cases. Okay, and how much does a Zimmer cold air machine cost? Um, a brand new machine would cost about seven to eight thousand dollars. Okay, and uh, for a patient with known allergy to iodine, any sclerosing agents to be aware of or contraindicated? Uh, the STS and polydoconol, 
I have not had any allergy issues. However, with STS, I've had occasions, uh, maybe af after treating thousands of patients over the last 30 years, I probably have had three cases where they had some uh, visual uh, scintillations after the treatment, but after uh, a few minutes, they settled down. That's the extent of the reaction I've seen. Great. Uh, can you please explain the one plus one plus one equals five? Yes. So that's a very important tip that I have shared. So polydocanol and uh, STS, if you use by itself in a higher concentration, you're going to, the patient is going to be prone to getting hemosiderin staining. In order to reduce that risk, what I have figured is one can combine low concentration, lower concentration of poly, poly or polydocanol and STS and mix it with hypertonic saline. And thereby you are using three different agents in lower concentration. The oral product is a very powerful, potent agent, which will give beautiful results and at the same time reduce the chance of hemosiderin staining. Uh, next question uh, is, what would be the mixture about for resistant telangiectasis? telangiectasis? So again, first I would make sure that there is no axial reflux. I would make sure there is no inflow reflux with, from the tributaries. I would make sure that the small, smaller vessels which we saw in the microcutaneous, I mean, microcirculation, the cutaneous microcirculation, uh, there are no subdermal vessels identified with a high, uh, <clears throat> with a higher wavelength probe. And if there is any of that inflow or reflux, it's best to treat that and then addressing the venous telangiectasias. If they're resistant, the, the combination agent with the cryosclerotherapy in my hand, in mean, my mind, is very effective. Good. There's another nice comment, a very nice presentation, most knowledgeable. Um, there's a follow up uh, Are those aneurysmal spider veins very friable and hence difficult to remove with microflebectomy? So <clears throat> if you use tumescence and use a very, very tiny hook, uh, there is no problem. All you need to do is to, to uh, you first use a very low dilution uh, cryosclerotherapy and then do, even if you use a 16 gauge needle just to remove the connections, I can guarantee you, you will have awesome results. Good. Uh, have you seen many cases uh, of nerve damage following sclerotherapy? I have not seen after treating thousands of patients in the last 30 years. And I think that's technique, certainly technique driven. If you're careful, uh, uh, it'll be a very uncommon complication. Uh, for patients with darker skin tone, how often are there adverse effects of using laser on the face? You mean for veins on the face? Thinks I, I believe that's true, yes. So if there are reticular veins, I would say using lower settings with the ND AG laser uh, 1064 can be utilized very carefully with the use of the cold air, which is usually with the machine. So that will be, that, that is possible. Um, <clears throat> spider veins are usually not an issue with skin type five and six. So that's not- Fitz, Fitzpatrick five and six. Uh, if, if that is an issue, uh, I have had good success even with the KTP uh, 532 wavelength laser um, in, in, with the lower setting. However, one has to be very careful. Uh, I would not use it on type six, but I, I have used it on type five four and five.
Great, thank you. Um, next question, you mentioned that staining is more common with foam than in liquid. So do you therefore only use liquid sclerosin for reticular and spider veins? I have used liquid sclerotherapy very effectively for reticular veins, but foam can be used in lower concentration to be effective and shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, the, the French, uh, I think the better sclerotherapist you are, the, uh, the uh, more that you want to use foam. Uh, French are quite, uh, quite good at using foam. Uh, next one is, what's your preference in the type of sclerosant in darker skin patients? So <clears throat> I use the lowest concentration, try to figure out which one is most effective, whether it's STS or poly, because some people will tolerate one versus the other. There is no way to guess which one is better. So I try to figure out in my first session by doing one leg with one and the other leg with the second, the other leg with the other. And then the next session, I customize my <clears throat> cocktail with one cocktail, meaning whichever solution is, has been deemed to be better, I use that from the second session on. So I quickly figure out which is the right, uh, which is the right sclerosin for that given patient, and then move forward. Start with the lowest concentration and move upwards, meaning go up on the concentration gradually. Yeah. Very good. Uh, can matting clear on its own, on its own without uh, treatment? I think you answered that, but you can re-answer it. Yeah. So <clears throat> matting may clear within. Uh, a few weeks. So it's best to wait, see if the angioneogenesis clears by itself. If not, then one has to look for any reflux at the, the feeder level as we discussed. And uh, follow up to resistant spider veins, how much of each chlorosin would you use? Maybe they're talking about uh, concentrations. So I titrate my, my sclerosin. It's absolutely individualized. I tailor to the patient's needs and each individual is very different. I customize my venous cocktail, as I said, based on the skin type. Um, you know, the darker skin type may need a lower concentration. The lighter skin type may tolerate little higher concentration. Okay. Are there any facial veins that you would perform scleral on, such as thready veins on the side of the nares or low on the face? So there are some providers who use foam sclerotherapy for reticular veins. I prefer not to because I have the NDAG laser, the 1064 NDAG laser, which gives me beautiful results with the use of the cold air by cooling it down and making the vein shrink. I have beautiful results around the eyes, on the temples, on the forehead, and I have no problems in getting that. With the spider veins, I have beautiful results around the nose and on the cheeks, chin, forehead, with the uh, KDP 532 wavelength laser. Okay, okay. Uh, does weightlifting cause varicose veins in women? So what I tell patients is, if one is predisposed genetically, and they do high impact exercises or heavy weights, they are likely to exacerbate the problem. Uh, so I tell them to reduce the amount of weight, but increase the reps, and that will resolve their issue. And do you use four megahertz wave re radio frequency for telangiectasia? Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, do you use a four megahertz wave radio frequency for telangiectasia? Oh, <clears throat> no, I have tried it in the past, but I did not get good results. So I did not continue further. I tried that about 20 years ago and I was not very impressed. I know there are providers who use it periodically, but I have not had good results. So I abandoned that modality. Okay. Uh, when you speak of the lowest concentration, is that 0.33% for poly? So, you know, uh, 
yes, the 0.33%, actually 0.1% is probably where I would start and go up to 0.33, but I totally customize, as I said, my Venus cocktail. So it's not, a, not it's not, there is no cookbook approach. I totally individualize for a given patient to get the best results. Uh, would you comment on using vein go treatment for facial spider veins? Uh, Vengo is RF modality, basically, and I have not had, I've tried it, I've not had good results, and I, I stopped using it. Okay. Um, we have no more questions at the, at the present time. Uh, wait a minute, there's a... Uh... No, we don't have, we have no more questions at, at the present time. Um, do we want to wait for more questions or do we want to wrap this up? We can wait while we pitch for Dr. Laura Kelsey's next um, next uh, CME webinar, which is Tuesday, October 27, 6.30 p.m., which is in five weeks. It's all about DVT. So if anybody is interested, please register on the website listed on the on the slide and uh, you can join, uh, get to know about everything you need to know and was afraid to ask about DVT. And knowing Dr. Kelsey, that'll be an excellent talk, I'm sure. Um, uh, can someone please post the email address for a copy of the charts and additional information? That's just a comment uh, from someone. So, Yes, we have um, posted the email address that everyone can email, uh, jessica.freeze at centerforvein.com. Okay, great. I was looking back. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a message here. Please take the survey on today's presentation and discussion. Uh, there's a survey monkey. Uh, there's a, there is a uh, link to it. I'm not sure where that link appears. So on the CVR website, I think some of the educational material is there. So even for the slides one in the videos, one can go to the CVR website. Okay. Uh, can we view this webinar again? Yes, it'll be on YouTube in a couple of days and it'll be there for your review. Another comment, thank you for this very nice presentation. Uh, and the uh, final question is, where is the CME claim? So I think it was on that second slide, which you presented. It'll, it'll automatically, Gina, you want to comment on that, please? Yes. So if you have registered, um, we did check you in. And uh, Vinny Mangiacopra has uh, provided a link for, for you guys to access. And we will follow up with an email um, to those that registered with um, their CME certificate in PDF form. Okay, I believe we're out of questions. I haven't seen any more come in. Uh, again, Dr. Shaw, very nice presentation. I think it was well received. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And as a reminder, please check your email and the Zoom chat for the registration link to our next CME, as well as the link to our survey to improve or to ensure proper receipt of your CME certificate. Having said that, I hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Have a great evening, everyone.